Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Media Watch. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. I'm Raymond Peterson. And I'm their guest and friend, Alan Singer. Alan Singer is a regular with Media Watch, and we love it. And uh, it's being taped the Wednesday before our usual Monday air. Brought to you by EVT Educational Productions, Zoom, and Manhattan Neighborhood Network, where maybe this show that we're taping now will air next Monday, or the previous show that we taped <laughs> two weeks ago will air. We yes, we're air today. We're happens. airing February 15th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What happens, happens. So, but, but anyway, <laughs> we'll post it on YouTube and LinkedIn and wherever, just to make sure folks can get to it. In any event, um, we've seen so many things coming across all our inboxes that we've labeled this show the show of the crazies, the list of the crazies and the craziness that's transpiring, not just in this country, but globally. But let's start in this country. Um, and we say craziness because it was a story, major story, uh, got overshadowed by the earthquake, but train derailment in, um, what's this town, Bob, East? Uh, East Pal Palestine, East Palestine, Palestine Ohio. Yes. <laughs> right, because I want to pronounce it Palestine because yes. it's spelled just like Palestine, but it's East Palestine. Uh, and the derailment, approximately 20 cars may have derailed or 20 cars uh, had chemicals in it that derailed, more cars derailed, but of the cars that derailed, maybe 55 or so, 20 had chemicals, 10 of them had some weird, weird chemicals. Uh, and so it was a major spill. Uh, and they had to deliberately vent it. And then they had to set it a fire to stop, make things from becoming worse. Uh, and then they had trouble putting out the fire, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but what caught my attention in conjunction with the spill was this a, 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 a reporter for what was that right leaning outlet? Uh, I think it was a News Nation reporter. News was Nation. On the scene. Um, uh, what's his last name? Latham, Latham, something like that. Uh, and he was doing a stand up while Governor DeWine was about to start a press conference. Uh, the way most reporters do at a live event just before briefing, he managed to get his stand up, whatever his report to, but before he could quite finish it, the governor started speaking and lo and behold, he was descended upon by local law enforcement who proceeded to get in his way and chastise him for speaking while the governor was speaking. Uh, to make a long story short, they took him down, handcuffed him, in a very, very unprofessional police way. And they took him to jail. And he spent some time in jail, uh, despite the fact that the rest of the reporters saying, what are you people doing? This is crazy. And his news outlet was saying, that's our person. You need, he does not need to be in jail. And DeWine, when he heard about it said, that's not supposed to happen. How did that happen? That, that, that wasn't on my order. Uh, so that's one of the crazies, because in this country, reporters are supposed to do their job without fear of police interference and without fear of being hauled off into jail. What's your take on this, guys? I mean, I was it, telling you before we went on air that I've covered so many press conferences and, and uh, uh, public hearings and whatnot, where the timing gets off, as it did in this case. They were supposed to start the, the conference earlier, but it got delayed, and it got delayed so late that it ran into his uh, airtime. So for the live shot. And I've seen so many times when people uh, do the news reports during an event as it happens, they whisper into the mic and the mic, we have really good mics nowadays. And they, and you know, and, and that's that. I looked at the video. There was no, it's not like the reporter was right in front of the governor. He was in the back of a pretty empty room. And literally the governor actually didn't even know that it happened. Mm -hmm. So that's how far away he was. He did not in any way affect the governor, yet these local police officers decided that they needed to take him outside, shove him on the ground, handcuff him, and haul him out. Stupid. What were the charges, Ray? What, criminal trespass or something to that effect? Something, something to that effect. Yeah, uh, criminal yeah. trespass and, and, and a risk, not resisting arrest. Disturbing the peace. Uh, yeah, I think it was disturbing the peace. Yeah. Was, was this reporter African-American? 
it turns out he, he evidently was. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it makes you wonder whether that was a factor in the police response. And it's a possibility. Exactly. And just to be clear, the reporter's name is Evan Lambert of a News Nation. Just to, uh, you know, we try to be accurate here. Yes. News, news Nation. That's right. That's right. That's what it was. That's, uh, I'm not familiar with that publication. Yeah, it's it's a it's an on it's it's a it's a it's TV outlet. It's it's a broadcast outlet uh, along the lines of uh, not necessarily quite like uh, ON or Newsmax. Okay, but, but 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 in that direction. Yeah, my sense. Uh, okay, but let's not go out on a limb because yeah, I've never sure. watched okay. this stuff. I've never watched this stuff. So, yes. <laughs> so. Eric, I have a question. How does how does this kind of toxic chemical disaster happen? Well, Alan, these trains crisscross the country, North America, really, because they run through Canada, they run through the United States. And it's because there's a heavy load of stuff that uh, Bob probably knows the numbers better than I do, that trucks can't handle. And it's usually stuff that needs large containers to hold the volume of oil or liquid natural gas or chemicals. And so you get these giant rolling, now they're calling them rolling bombs. The NRDC, an organization that deals with this type of environmental watchdog stuff, calls them rolling bombs because the Trump administration decided to let natural liquid natural gas become part of the rolling trains knowing full well that a liquid natural gas spill would be far more devastating than just a typical oil spill. But he did an executive order. He, he, he loosened all the EPA regulations. So these trains now crisscross. They've been crisscrossing the country forever. People tried to crack down and put in regulation. But DeWine was very surprised that the train that exploded at derail was not listed as a hazardous train, mm. material train. That's so, Governor DeWine of Ohio, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. Governor, I believe it's Mike DeWine of Ohio. And so in one of the news conferences, he was saying, I, I'm told that that's the case, that for some reason, this train had an exception that was legal. And he said, if that's true, and I believe it's true, this is totally absurd that this train carrying these chemicals can be rolling out without telling the local states or any people that they're carrying these hazardous materials. For some reason, they're allowed to do that. He says, Congress needs to act on this. Well, I, I, I'm laughing when I read that because thanks to Trump's EPA, they've loosened all these rules and regs that were supposed to keep some of this stuff in check. And I don't think they've fully purged all those Trump appointees out of the EPA. <laughs> so why am I not surprised that it's difficult for us to get a straight answer about whether those chemicals are causing more problems? What have you guys heard about the latest? Because they told the people they could go back home, that there was no danger in the water. And now I'm hearing stories about the fact that, oh, wait, wait, there may be more problems. What have you guys heard? Well, just in the news report that I saw, I see they found they, 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 a lot of fish were killed, but it turned out none of the fish were endangered, uh, and some birds were killed, and uh, some local wildlife. Uh, but uh, it, as I understand it, it was an axle, that axle problem that caused all of this. Uh, so it could be, you know, they didn't maintain it or whatever. But anyway, yeah, it's a it, rather big mess out there. I, I think they said the same thing about thalidomide back in the 50s. Oh, well, perfectly safe chemical, nobody's in danger. Well, they know they know some of these chemicals are dangerous. <laughs> no, they're not even saying that. What it's I'm worried about, up 10, 15 years from now. We're going to see I'm, the water. What I'm worried about is this bit about, oh, yeah, we only found trace elements in the water, and so far, we think it's safe, et cetera, but we've heard those stories before. That's what they said about the chemicals it, after 9-11, lower Manhattan. Lo and behold, we know differently. So uh, if I were the East Palestine, Palestine, East Palestine, Palestine yes. folk, I, 
I might be trying to sell my house and moving because I wouldn't trust the water. I wouldn't trust the soil. I wouldn't trust anything in the vicinity of that train wreck. But that's part of the crazy that one, they still let these trains <laughs> roll across the country and they've loosened these regulations. There's a push to get the Biden administration to rescind the Trump administration rescinding of the previous ban on some of these things. So we shall see how that goes. Uh, but uh, in the line of crazies, it, it would not surprise me if they had a hard time with the chemical lobbyists and the fossil fuel lobbyists being what they are, trying to get that EPA back up to strength the way it was prior to, to Trump doing what he did. Uh, but next on our crazy list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, that's the thing. We may not have time really to address the toxic bombs in our trains because we got to worry about Chinese weather balloons. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well see, the craziness <laughs> about the Chinese weather balloon is the fact that the military knew it wasn't a weather balloon. The military said, yeah, we need to deal with it. And they determined that now nah, we can't deal with it now because it might come down over populated. We all know that story. And they said, we're going to wait. And because they said they're going to wait, and then they shot it down over the Atlantic as opposed to over the Aleutian waters, there's a big brouhaha between the Republicans and the Democrats about who did what and why shouldn't we do it earlier. And my take on that is, look, the military is the guy, Joe Biden, the president, said, we need to take that out. And the military, the guys who worry about Chinese stuff, said, yeah, we'll take steps to mitigate what they're doing, and then we shoot it down when it's safe. And so they waited. Now, all this back and forth about <laughs> whether they shot it down early or not. Well, look, I'm an ex-military person. I believe that the military do, does their best, its utmost, to make sure they keep the country safe, big umbrella safe, and keep our citizens safe on day-to-day -day stuff, like let's not shoot down planes, bombs, or things that might fall and kill civilians. And so I had no problem with the weight. Did they do mitigating stuff to make sure the Chinese super secret surveillance stuff didn't collect much data? I have no way of knowing. They may and they may not have, but we have to rely on the fact that they have decent capabilities. You notice all of a sudden they were seeing all kinds of new things like square objects and cylindrical <laughs> objects that were all getting shot down because guess what? They recalibrated and retuned. So anything that went away, uh oh, go get that. <laughs> so, you know, Lady Voldemort. Talk about the other balloons, Alan. Part so of the crazy. Lady Voldemort in Congress, because we said we would not say her name. Uh, Lady Voldemort in Congress, who at the State of the Union accused Joe Biden of being a liar and then shouted bullshit at the uh, <laughs> congressional uh, briefing uh -huh. as, as a result of her shenanigans, they now attacking all the balloons. Well, I was looking up with the blo a balloon like they, the ones they took down cost between a hundred and a thousand dollars. Well, every one of the missiles that they shot at a balloon cost. $400,000. The jet cost $200 million. The jet fuel cost $36,000 per hour per jet. Okay. But I think the balloons and Lady Voldemort are conspiring to bankrupt the United States. All right. The jet, we don't put that in the equation because the jet can still work. The jet will fly. We don't put the cost of the jet. The jet fuel does cost money. And people say, well, why didn't they use bullets? Well, they tried bullets in 2016, the Canadians, and they pumped a thousand bullets in a giant balloon and the balloon just kept flying. So they realized, because when the Canadian jet fighters couldn't bring that balloon down, the US sent some fighters up and I figured who else sent some fighters. I think the Brits may have sent some fighters. That balloon actually ended up coming down in Finland. That's how far that went after mm -hmm. it got pumped with a thousand bullets. The so wounded said, okay, balloon. <laughs> we want to bring it down. We better use missiles. <laughs> we ain't bring it down. And by the way, that Chinese balloon, that wasn't any little old whatever. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was a giant <laughs> balloon <laughs> with a whole lot. Did you see the trucks with the stuff they loaded that payload on? When I saw some pictures of the stuff. I mean, they had almost a tractor trailer full of stuff. 
from the payload that that Chinese balloon was carrying. So I know they're going to get a lot of interesting <laughs> information. If we inflate it, we could use it next year at the Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> Maybe. Well, no. It would be quite the attraction. But uh, what one thing as a tech guy, uh, I know, you know, the government, you know, the, our government can jam anything, it, whatever communications, whatever signaling, it, we can jam it. And they've not, they knew it was a, where it launched from, they knew where it was. The thing about this balloon is that we could all see it. Mm. It wasn't a spy satellite, which none of us would have noticed. Right. So, you know, I, I, I listened to these Republicans say, well, you let it go all the way across the country scanning us. No, it didn't scan us. We were, um, I can't, I have no evidence. Obviously, obviously they're not going to tell us, but we, we know how to jam here in the U.S. Yeah, no, you're, you're correct, Bob. When they said they took mitigating steps, <laughs> that was as much as they're going to tell you that uh, we put up a shield so they couldn't get as much information as they thought they were going to get. And yeah, they may have gotten some stuff before the shield went up, uh, but we may have gotten just as much by recovering that balloon <laughs> to find out a lot of the stuff they were trying to get and where it might have been going to. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you're right, Bob and Alan. In fact, all you guys are right in that this was partisan partisan politics about why didn't you shoot it down earlier and, and let's jump on that horse, et cetera. Yeah, but, but it, as you hey, said, Eric, there's, there's a reason that we don't tell all that we know. You know, yeah, that's that's part of trying to keep story. the country safe. You're right. Yeah. We don't. You, you raise a good point, Ray. This bit about the American people need to know. Yes, sometimes, but there are other times where the American people don't need to know and don't need to be told because telling them might be telling our enemies more than we want them to know. So we just don't tell everything we know. And you're right. We don't need to tell. There, the old military phrase. There's a need to know. No, you don't need to know. <laughs> We're keeping you safe. <laughs> we hope, fingers crossed. To get on with more crazies before we run out of time, um, there was a- Tuscaloosa. No, no. Missouri okay. first. Oh. Because oh. Missouri is, is crazy because oh. the state legislature in Missouri refused to uphold a ban on young people walking around with AK-47. It is crazy. A kid, 14-year-olds, go walk down the street of St. Louis, Missouri, or any city in, in the state of Missouri with an AK-47, and a cop could not stop him and take it away, okay? That, to me, is the height of craziness. We can you run know, on and discuss it even further, but my point is, that is so crazy, it's not even worth discussing. Why would you allow kids to walk around with an AK-47? In 2016, they repealed the uh, concealed weapon a license. You no longer need a license to conceal carry either. You can carry out in the open or you can put it in your pocket. No restrictions. No age limitations. And no age That's limitations. That's my point yeah. about that Missouri legislature saying mm -hmm. a kid can walk around with an AK-47. All right. Okay. Uh, speaking of kids, now we can go to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> On the flip side, a kid's walk AK-47. Tell me about that Tuscaloosa story. The Tus well, the Tuscaloosa story is uh, Hillcrest High School in Tuscaloosa was uh, in honor of Black History Month. This group of students formed a league to have a presentation, but that was shot down because somebody in, in the state Congress felt uncomfortable. One person. Was oh, no, it was a school administrator, I think. Yeah, I, I thought it was in the state legislature. The, uh, the county upheld it, whatever, even if it started, wherever it started, it started with some administrative official. So the kids walked out? And the kids walked out. They walked out in pro protest. They only walked out for an hour, but they made it, they made their feelings very clear. And they've been supported. And it's just that you, you talk about crazy things. Well, One, one person was upset. It made me uncomfortable. I listen. Yeah, I, well, I, I'm uncomfortable about a lot of stuff. You want to hear about it? We're gonna gonna segue it? To, I'm going to say to Alan because that uncomfortable white school person who said white. uncomfortable, you can't talk about slavery or civil rights movement in your Black History Month presentation because she was uncomfortable. That leads me to Alan and the piece he wrote about yeah. white freedom which I now equate to today's version of white freedom 
is white wimpiness. That's the wimpiness of that cool person who could who felt uncomfortable. Alan, talk to us about how white wimpiness goes back to white freedom. <laughs> well, what, what happens in the resistance to desegregation? The, what you have in 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 the in the South, and it it's epitomized by George Wallace, who's governor of Alabama, gets elected in '62, takes office in '63. Alabama again, <laughs> and they're demanding the freedom for white people. They should not have to have any exposure, any uh, relationship with blacks. That imposes on my freedom, and it's a very interesting concept because we what we're looking at is your freedom gives you the right to deny freedom to other people. And that's what's happening here. My uncomfortability gives me the right to censor your ability to discuss what happened in history. Which is why I'm saying what used to be called white freedom now seems to be white wimpiness. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to coin a new phrase here, yeah, folks, right. and, and put that out into the ether. <laughs> But speaking of schools and school children, there was a not crazy because that was part of the craziness. But the antidote to that was the Pennsylvania judge who came down with a ruling a couple of weeks ago, or maybe just a few. Yeah, maybe a week and a half ago where he said you can't use property taxes and the, the usual yardstick to fund the education in the state of Pennsylvania, or at least in that particular county, or I'm not sure, I think it was a state judge. Yeah, yeah. so it must have been the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and dissect that for us real quick, Alan, because okay. the, they've been funding school education across the country using property taxes for years, and it's always been unequal. Poor people get worse education because they don't have as much money. White people, rich people usually get better education because they have more money. Okay, school funding is up to the state. And in most of the states, uh, it's supported by property taxes, like in New York State. The thing is, it's not in the law that it has to be that way. So when you support it by property tax, richer communities have more money for their schools. Now, starting in the 1990s, New Jersey uh, ruled that that was unconstitutional. And New York has also ruled it's unconstitutional to have that kind of unequal funding. So what the states have done is rather than getting rid of this local property tax, what they've done is they've supplemented it. But the reality is if you look at funding for regular education classes, it is never equal in any of the uh, states. No, no, no. I believe um, who state senator now used to be city council, uh, Jackson, Yes. He filed suit against the state of New York and said, this yes. is unequal. You need to be pouring more money into these poor school districts. And he won. Mm -hmm. And which is why they had to modify what they were doing. The state uh, still doesn't different. come out equal. And so this Pennsylvania, I think somebody wrote it up as this is an earthquake just shot across the bow of the state of Pennsylvania. Oh, they got to come up with a new funding formula. Let's see how that works. But that wasn't in the height that 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 for me was part of the crazy file because it's crazy that somebody actually came up with the fact that this is unequal. You need to do something about it. We don't seem to be able to do that in this country very often. But again, it's going to be appealed and it's going to go to the right wing United States Supreme Court. And we don't know what's going to happen. And that court could very well say, well, it's up to each individual state. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah. What else we got on the crazy list? Eric, wait a minute. I just want to clarify that the uh, Pennsylvania judge was uh, Judge Rene Con Jubelier, I believe it's pronounced J U B E L I E R. Okay. The judge said, okay, find another formula. Okay. We don't, oh. How much time we got left? Uh, we have uh, three and a half minutes left. Oh, Eric, you had some really good Trump quotes. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. But, yeah, yeah, all right, right. I just saw the story that came, that it was on my inbox the week, and the hail, one of those DC papers were actually collating stuff from Rolling Stone, which got an article out now talking about Donald Trump decided he kind of part of his reelection campaign is he's going to investigate whether he should bring back the guillotine, firing squads group executions, namely group hangings. <laughs> so <laughs> in public, in public. In, of course. He wouldn't be doing it privately. So, so the point of the matter is 
look out for more craziness coming out of, quote, at least one Republican candidate for president, one declared Republican candidate for president, who's also looking down the gun barrel of Fannie Willis's possible indictment in Georgia. Judge recently said some of that has to be given to the public, but he did say we'd be mindful of the rights of potential defendants, so not all of it's going to be made public. Well, and I think Donald that Trump wants to restore Western civilization and go back to ancient Rome where they would feed Christians to the lions. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's the Christians who are going to get fed in this case. Speaking of Rome and the Middle East and the Mediterranean, uh, international craziness is our good buddy over in Israel who's now trying to make good buddy in quotes, an autocratic state by de kneecapping his Supreme Court, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, getting ready to push through a law where they can de make the, in the, the judiciary no longer a, an independent entity in the state of Israel. There have been massive riots uh, yeah. in Jerusalem and, and around the country because people think that's a total grab for power uh, and he's caving to his right, 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 religious, hardline constituent that make up his government uh, and the rest of the country is not happy. I believe the polling I saw said 44% were against that move and 41%, which is pretty high, were for it. So hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets. Yeah, I actually thought it was a very good sign because, you know, a lot of Israeli policies and the occupation of the West Bank have, have really been reprehensible. But to see Israelis go out in the street and saying, look, that's not who we are. I think that was a very important statement. Interesting, because one, three organizations have said that the state of Israel is an apartheid state. And one of the three human rights organizations actually is in Israel itself. Yes. They came out and said that this is an apartheid state, the way you are treating the Palestinians and people residing in the country. And the mayor of Barcelona, Spain, decided she was going to cut ties with the state of Israel based on the fact that she is determined that they actually have fit the bill of an apartheid a state practicing apartheid. And Israel All right. And, and, and we have about 10 seconds. OK, that's it. This has been Media Watch, folks. I'm your co-host, Eric Tate. I'm Bob Anthony. Catch up to us at Media Watch EVT on YouTube. I'm Raymond Peterson. And I'm their friend and guest, Alan Singer. I hope the viewers had as much fun tonight as I did. <laughs> Educated historian, thank you again, Dr. Singer. Folks, thanks for joining us, joining us, and we'll catch you the next time.